People were all around the society, some were into the banking, some went into the government, etc. But all this, those relationships and this trust that this person can deliver, this, this state, and it, it enabled us to move very fast and do very, very innovative things. Welcome to this podcast created by the Estonia Briefing Center. In this series, we invite some of the most influential people in politics and business to discuss all angles of digitalization in Estonia and the world. From past learnings to current challenges and future plans. So take a seat, pour yourself a glass of your favorite drink and enjoy the art of digitalization. Hello and welcome to another iteration of the Art of Digitalization podcast by the Estonia Briefing Center. My name is Florian and today we have a very special occasion. Uh, first of all, uh, we have not one but two guests uh, at the podcast here. And number two, we are also celebrating an exciting anniversary. Uh, now, first of all, let's talk about our guests. Uh, we have Davi Mainberg. He is the product owner of the XT at the Estonian Information Systems Authority. And we also have Arne Ansper, who is the head of development at Cybernetica. I'm very happy to have you both here. How are you guys today? Thank you for asking. It's wonderful to be here. Thanks. All happy. That, that was a very Estonian answer. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, so, uh, does anybody want to tell me and us, the listeners, um, what is the exciting anniversary that we are talking about? It is the uh, X-20th birthday. That is precisely uh, the case. So um, you, sh you should know about it. Because <laughs> <laughs> it, it is sort of your, your bread and butter. Absolutely. Um, maybe you can tell us about uh, how, how the x -day has developed over, well, since its inception uh, in 2001 uh, up to today. Uh, what's been changing? What was the initial uh, aim of the project? Does it still fulfill that aim? Has it evolved far beyond that? Tell us everything. Well, that is a very interesting and thought-provoking question. Uh, the uh, overall goal of FIXTA uh, would be to connect the different information systems, both in the public and in the private sector, to allow for a secure and standardized data exchange between the information systems. And uh, if you're asking whether we're still fulfilling that goal today, then yes, I think we absolutely are, and we've absolutely smashed it. <laughs> uh, the implementation of uh, ICSTA is, uh, has been uh, you know, a very long process, and it has uh, definitely uh, required several aspects of uh, other aspects of the E-Nation to follow along with it. But it has also become uh, this uh, solid foundation that the uh, further e-nation e uh, can be developed on. Mm -hmm. uh, Arna, you have uh, seen some of the earlier developments, I believe. Could you tell us more about um, how you've experienced the, these early days of, of the X-Road? Um, how was thought up? What was the political support like? Um, how did all of these developments uh, take place back in, well, I guess the starts came in the late 90s and, uh, and then the implementation in the early 2000s? I myself and Cybernetica got involved in, uh, in the development of Fixed Road uh, in the beginning of 2001. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of work has, was already done uh, for this time. There was a pilot project in Rizzo. There was kind of like a recognized need uh, to, de to develop a system to connect all the institutions, not just kind of like a bilateral communication. Could you enlighten our listeners what Risa is? Uh, it's Rizzo. It's that is so sorry, yes. I think it was Rigi Infosystem Osagond or something like this. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like a, a predecessor to, to RIA, mm -hmm. kind of. So it's to the information system agency authority. responsible yes. for developing governmental uh, IT. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that uh, one of the Mm, let's say biggest things that was uh, decided in 2001 uh, was the fact that uh, we are going to build a distributed system, not a centralized one as was uh, initially planned. And um, where did that mind change come from? Do you do you remember that? 
Uh, yes, it came from the security analysis of the initial concept. Mm -hmm. So this was actually my first task related <laughs> to the to the X-Road to, to analyze the concept. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, I, when we looked at the legislation, uh, what, how uh, the legal acts foresee how the governmental IT should be built up, what are the roles and responsibilities of institutions. So there was actually no a place for this kind of like a central hub that is mediating all the data flows. Mm -hmm. And also from the security viewpoint, it was a bad idea because that would create a mm, very attractive target for attackers. Because yes. if you get access to this, you get access to most of the uh, information flows in, in Estonia. Yeah. So a couple of important things. And, and also... Um, what was probably not realized during the proof of concept projects was that one thing is that you can do in kind of like a laboratory environment mm -hmm. where you don't have to follow the legislation and you can build very simple, nice technical solutions. But as soon as you want to go to live and you have to follow all the legal acts and rules, then the situation is completely different. And I think that one of the big achievements was that we uh, designed a system that we could implement without changing any legal acts. Mm -hmm. Of course, we had a very good platform already. We had the Database Act, we had Digital Signature Act, we had an act on public, uh, public information, etc. Yes. So yeah. a lot of uh, very good legislation was there. Mm -hmm. But the fact that we managed to, to create something uh, completely new and as we know today, very sustainable <laughs> and useful mm -hmm. without uh, uh, changing the legal acts. Uh, and, and this also uh, enabled us to deploy it very quickly. Now, you mentioned this sort of offhandedly at the very start. Um, you worked for Cybernetica at I the still time, do, yes. uh, precisely, yeah. Yeah. yes. Um, and uh, but you created a, a system effectively of, that would serve the Estonian government. Yeah. Um, so public-private partnership has been around in Estonia for quite some time now. I think it's fair to say. Um, can you perhaps uh, first, Arna, you, and then Tavi after, afterwards, you um, explain to me where that openness for public-private partnership came from and perhaps also how it is practiced still today? Hmm. First of all, I, I, I think that actually w when we did the work for the government, it mm -hmm. was still kind of like made uh, based on the public procurements. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, uh, the, uh, let's say the situation uh, like 20 years ago, it was a little bit different because um, society was younger. People were much more enthusiastic. Uh, people were uh, ready to take much more risks, I would say. Mm -hmm. And also one thing that we cannot overlook was that uh, when we regained our independence, uh, there were lots of talented people uh, in different academic institutions working very closely together. And now the new opportunities opened. So it was kind of like explosion. A big Pe flood pe of people, people were all around the society. Some were into the banking, some went into the government, some stayed in the academia, some established companies, etc. But all this, those relationships and this trust that this person can deliver, this, this state. Yeah. And it, it enabled us to move very fast and do very, uh, not risky things, but very innovative things because people were trusting each other. They, were, they, they knew what the partner is capable of mm -hmm. doing. And I think that this really accelerated. And like even like 10 years after our uh, independence, I think this vibe, it was very strong still. And, and this really helped. But now, 30 years later, like people have moved further away. There are no such explosions. It's not, not just kind of like a mixing up of society. And I think that you can feel it. Like it's much harder to get a, like a very good working relationship. Uh, of course you can, but it takes time. And you must prove it yourself over and over and over. Yeah, absolutely. One of the uh, supporting factors of why we can think of Estonia as an e-nation powerhouse has definitely been because um, our uh, IT systems and infrastructure kind of uh, developed uh, naturally alongside of our own nation. Mm -hmm. With uh, This allowed us to have like this uh, digital uh, principality in mind and it has definitely given, given us a great advantage so that we don't have the situation that uh, perhaps uh, some other countries, nations today have, where they have uh, decades of IT infrastructure 
and they're starting to think about digital nations now. Yeah. And so implementing that, uh, when you have years and years of uh, IT infrastructure already built up, is a much grander and uh, more difficult prospect, definitely. Um, before we continue talking about your current view of public-private partnership, um, I wanted to dig into this this topic that we just unearthed. Um, as a political scientist, I, I have to have to go into this a bit deeper. Um, can one maintain this uh, boost of openness and uh, general trust relationship in society, or is this just something that we? as people living in Estonia have to accept that this is a once in a, not even a lifetime, but once in a nation existence thing uh, that we've been able to make use of once and that will be gone forever? Or can we cultivate that somehow? Really hard question. I mean, like, uh, uh, because so much has changed. And mm -hmm. like, for, for example, uh, I think 20 years ago, um, IT was still young. Uh, and and also I think that uh, um, or rather I think a lot of bureaucracy had been introduced uh, in 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 those <laughs> last 20 years, uh, partially uh, due to the, our accession to EU. Of course, mm -hmm. we had to harmonize our laws, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, it's it's really yeah. I would say that uh, cybernetica do they. Uh, does quite a lot of uh, projects for, for government. Mm -hmm. and, and we see that uh, public procurements, they are more heavyweight. And, uh, and let's say the, um, there is not much flexibility. Mm -hmm. But I really don't know uh, how much is due to the people and the relationships between people and mm -hmm. how much is due to the, this legal framework that we must follow and all those rules for using... Uh, Ever-growing amounts of uh, paperwork. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So so might be that with, uh, let's say, more liberal <laughs> uh, rules for public procurements, we might have a better result, better, more efficient kind of like a development of systems. So yeah. who knows? It's what are your thoughts, Davi? Yeah, uh, definitely a complex and many fa uh, multifaceted topic. But th when we're talking about the public procurement, one of the key aspect, aspects is that it's public. It's uh, developed uh, by the, uh, the projects are led by the government and mm -hmm. as such, I think it's absolutely correct that uh, everything we do is public and uh, we should try to be and maintain this opacity, this visibility throughout uh, these development projects. And one of the key things, uh, since bureaucracy was mentioned here, one of the key things that uh, definitely uh, affects that and the level of bureaucracy is uh, definitely the funding aspects of uh, this uh, these projects because in uh, the private sector, Uh, the projects are funded by the uh, organization's own sources, own income. So they're really only risking the revenue, the money that they earn, the resources that they earn. But uh, in the public sector, that might not necessarily be the case. When we're talking about uh, the taxpayer money, the funding provided by different uh, organizations and etc., then uh, there needs to be some framework, some Uh, steps, uh, some bureaucracy, as we call it, mm -hmm. to help maintain that this uh, expenditure is bringing value. And this is one of the reasons why definitely in the public sector we are more, unfortunately, paperwork focused or like uh, we have these uh, stricter requirements, definitely. Uh, but as, as exactly as you pointed out, you know, it's it's not uh, all with malicious intent. Absolutely um, not. So <laughs> there, there, there is a good reason for, for some of it. Uh, being from mm -hmm. Germany myself, I've uh, experienced the other side of, of, uh, of that particular coin where um, uh, there is a wonderfully uh, loaded digitalization fund for schools in Germany, uh, which uh, has uh, millions of euros still unused. 
um, because the schools that would apply for these, um, effectively, the, the the paperwork is so ex- <laughs> so massive uh, in proportions that uh, you would need to hire an additional person to fill out that paperwork, <laughs> and so people don't apply for that. Absolutely, and uh, with, with this increased paperwork, uh, depending on how regulated it is, then there might be a risk that. You know, uh, the uh, project would have to uh, would not get funded because uh, one a checkbox was not ticked yeah. or whatever. So there definitely needs to be a balance. We uh, shouldn't uh, go full paperwork, uh, paper only. Let's uh, all the rules always, but also we in the public sector cannot really allow for a full startup mentality mm. of uh, hey, if we go bust, you know, we'll make a new organization. It doesn't yeah. it doesn't work like that, unfortunately. That's true. And uh, we definitely have a responsibility to the citizens, to the funders, and uh, this is this is why it's uh, two two uh, worlds almost. Absolutely. Um, let's cast our minds back to the X road, though. Um, uh, now. I feel like most people that are listening to this podcast, they will have heard about the extra. They know about the the idea of decentralized uh, data exchange. Um, but perhaps what is not so clear to them is how it has developed uh, as a technology, as an ecosystem over the years. Um, uh, they would probably assume that that most things have stayed relatively similar to uh, what it was in 2001. Can you shed some light on how it has developed over the years? I personally joined uh, the State Information Authority in 2017. Mm-hmm. So unfortunately, I cannot give the from birth to now I'm over tired. <laughs> Exactly, <laughs> I would have been four years old if uh, when it when it you know first introduced. So, uh, but definitely, even throughout these uh, three or four years, then there have been changes. Uh, one of the most uh, biggest one in my time was definitely the switch from uh, version 5 of X-Road to version 6 because this uh, incorporated in it uh, on a technical level uh, a switch in the message protocol underneath it which meant that the two uh, the two versions of X- uh, Xter could not really communicate with each other so if an mm-hmm. uh, organization joined Xter v5 version 5 then they couldn't really uh, they couldn't really exchange data with uh, those organizations that uh, were on version 6. Mm-hmm. So that was definitely one of the biggest changes in recent times, one of the more difficult changes to uh, try and uh, uh, implement a smooth transition from version, version 5 to version 6. But uh, I think uh, by today we have only version 6 available and mm-hmm. uh, it is uh, incredibly popular. We have recently uh, achieved uh, the uh, sorry uh, 1000 uh, members member organizations mm-hmm. that have joined Xter and uh, i think this really shows that it has been adopted really well and uh, continuously adopted in estonia uh you having perhaps a, a slightly more mm. I don't want to say ancient but a, a mm. larger outlook on the mm. history of Xter can you tell us more mm. For for me, uh, there are actually like a two completely different uh, periods. Like the first one was starting from 2001, uh, which was really really interesting year for 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 me and for for us, <laughs> like mm-hmm. as a cybernetica. In the spring, we did the security analysis. There was a very quick uh, public procurement. In June, we started to program. In December, we went into production with the uh, complete system. <laughs> Uh, and Cybernetica was at this time uh, manufacturing or producing um, a VPN system called Privador, which was hugely popular in Estonia. So basically what we did to implement the X-Road was that we took this existing system as a substrate, we cut off what was not needed, and we created something that was kind of like a missing. So we had existing platforms that we could reuse for repurpose for, for creating this infrastructure, and I think this was really really fast project i mean like um, and and the platform was completely different uh, than the current platform is and also it was built for the uh, legal uh, frameworks that we had at this time mm-hmm. and the biggest change that we saw was actually related to the digital signature legislation because this was something that was harmonized across european union and uh, Estonian existing uh, law on digital signature, it was kind of like a, um, 
it was not in force anymore. And in the beginning of uh, like in like 2010, something like this, mm. um, we also did some projects outside Estonia, and it was clear that the concepts that worked in 2001, where basically our focus was to create a system that is really easy to deploy, uh, absolutely secure, so that we could put those security servers into the public internet, the internet without any, any fear that they are kind of like uh, broken or cracked. Uh, uh, and it was okay to have a closed system, like a really closed system without any extensibility outside. In 2010, it was already clear that we need an uh, open system. We need to be able to use uh, existing PKIs. We don't have to, we cannot just rely on our own internal PKI. Uh, there was a new digital signature legislation, new digital signature standards, and also a lot of practical things that uh, users of the X-Road uh, needed. And of course, this international aspect, like how we can create a system that is not just for one country, but that many countries could use. Uh, and uh, so that their own interests are protected because every nation wants to have full control over their critical infrastructure. Like it's, it's not acceptable to, to be relying on somebody else to supply what is like a like a plot system of, of, of a digital digital nation. Yeah, no worries. Lithuania is providing everything. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and at the same time, they need to collaborate. Like mm -hmm. cross-border uh, digital services, it's, it's a hot topic still in, in Europe. And, and uh, so in 2011, uh, we had a chance to start from the scratch. So mm -hmm. Cybernetic actually uh, created a project together with Elico. It was a kind of like a um, development center. Uh, and, and we started to create a, a new product. What we took from X-Road, existing X-Road was experience and all those kind of like requirements. And we really started from scratch and, and uh, figured out what are the needs, what we need to do, what is a roadmap, what are the priorities, etc. And we started to the, the work together with RIA. We joined our consortia to create this technology. And, and this is a kind of like the birth of, of the new X road. And uh, the key things they stayed. I mean, like this idea is that you have a peer to peer communication network with central coordination, which is very important. Uh, and, and also, like this. Um, existence of digital signature for all the exchange data. Yeah. And I think this is something that people often overlook. They don't uh, understand the importance of this. But basically, f for me, this is something that, that makes the X-Road kind of like illegal. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, when Davi mentions that what x is providing is kind of like a standardized and a secure uh, framework for communication, for me, most important thing is that everything that you receive from the X-Road has a legal meaning and you can use this data or this information in your decision making process without any additional paper evidence. Mm -hmm. And this is something that allows us to get rid of paper and to create a real digital nation and then automate the processes, etc. And, and uh, of course, it's, it's a heavy burden. I mean, like digital signature technology, is, it's not a lightweight, but, but the fact that you don't have to think about it, is this uh, information like a uh, with, with legal guarantee, can I use it freely in my decision-making process or not? I mean, for me, this is an important thing. And this is what we retained. But most of the other things, like from the technological side, are completely renewed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. This uh, legal principle, this uh, is something that is a fundamental requirement, a cornerstone of uh, such a digital implementation. Because uh, when we're talking about providing counsel for other possible nations to uh, adopt or look into adopting uh, this uh, X-Road-based solution for their nation, then uh, this is definitely something that we want to make clear is uh, almost a hard requirement to make sure that this digital signature is uh, legally almost binding, legally binding, so that uh, you don't, there isn't this gray zone of uh, is this document it's that I sent certainty. exactly yeah. Yeah. if there is any of that then really it, it cannot uh, lead into a good digital nation yeah uh, Arne you you mentioned um, the international aspect of things mm -hmm. and I think that's where I would like to take our conversation next uh, perhaps Davi first with you um, so of course the the X day is the 
uh, is the Estonian ecosystem that has grown from from this software. But Estonia does also do some cross-border activities. Can you tell us more about the current state of cross-border data exchange facilitated by the XTX Road uh, solutions? Absolutely. So uh, yes, Estonia has the XT implementation, uh, which is based on the XROAD technology, but also a similar ecosystem on XROAD technology has been implemented in our northern neighbor, Finland. So they have their own uh, instance of XROAD, their own national implementation of this. And uh, thanks to XROAD technology, we are able to um, change exchange uh, data uh, via our solutions uh, across borders. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe that uh, one of the uh, data systems that does that is the population registries. And uh, so this type of data is being changed by our two nations, I at think, least on some level. Yeah, I think there is still so much uh, that, that we can do and, and so much that uh, people from less digital nations, like they, they can't even think about. As a simple example, uh, if I move from Estonia to Germany or vice versa, um, why do I have to unregister myself in one place and register myself in, in the other? Why not just register in the new place and it automatically gives a notification to my to my former place of residence that hey, he's gone. You know, uh, there are uh, this is the most simple example, and I'm sure that we can come up with many more complex uh, solutions uh, as as well um is is there a roadmap or any any future plans for uh, estonian cross border uh, data exchange or cooperation with other countries beyond finland that you can tell us about uh, i think uh, some of the focus has been on our other surrounding neighbors mm -hmm. so especially looking southwards uh, so there is definitely uh, an effort uh, being made i think in that regard mm -hmm. But uh, I don't really have anything concrete right now that I can offer. That's okay. But uh, it would definitely be a dream to, you know, uh, have something uh, implemented uh, perhaps uh, across Europe to mm -hmm. um, make uh, the uh, nations connected by that. Yeah. Because I, I believe it would really lead to a new quality for the citizens of uh, such uh, nations. And for example, based, uh, based on pure, purely myself, when I think about uh, perhaps a life in some other nation or whatever, uh, I start thinking about the in inconveniences of uh, processes that are digitalized in Estonia. Yeah. So like, uh, for example, the taxation declaration, the uh, income, de uh, income declaration and um, other like uh, processes that in Estonia take only a few minutes that can be done via a homepage, a web page, uh, via internet that would require me to go to a physical office somewhere with a physical pen, fill out physical papers. And uh, this is definitely one factor that is uh, a real benefit to Estonian citizens, I think. I remember very clearly uh, when I moved to the UK and uh, I got this beautiful uh, cardboard card from uh, the NHS uh, that, that was my healthcare card. And they, they uh, also were so generous to laminate it for me in front of me. Uh, but that was my healthcare record uh, for my time in the UK. I so. mean, you, you know it's high quality if they yeah. laminate it. <laughs> uh, then you know it's reliable. Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, Arne, uh, Cybernetica is is active uh, in the data exchange business, um, not just in Estonia but also abroad. Can you tell us maybe about about the most recent uh, clients um, and whether whether the demands towards a system of data exchange are very very similar to what Estonia expects uh, of such a solution, or or whether based on culture or or, or politics uh, the expectations would be very different. Yes, that's correct. Uh, we do a lot of work uh, internationally. Uh, I would say that uh, our data exchange technologies department is almost exclusively <laughs> uh, working outside Estonia mm -hmm. and we'll have a number of um, like uh, really big installations. Biggest one is in Ukraine. It's a national uh, governmental backbone, Trembita, is built using UXP technology. And if you asked about uh, did we have changed anything? Then yes. <laughs> and, uh, in it was Ukraine. not just copy paste. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 easiest project in the world. No. <laughs> no. No interoperability project is easy. Yeah. I mean, like this is hardest type of project you can imagine. 
and uh, even inside one country and not to talk about the international like across border mm-hmm. systems because everybody should agree that yes this is a technology that we want to invest on and that this, this is a technology that we would like to use mm-hmm. and it's really really hard but in ukraine the specific problems that we had was related to the security and cryptography in particular because uh, uh, ukraine had their own cryptographic algorithms mm-hmm. that were kind of like a mandatory to use like if governmental agencies were exchanging data over open networks they had to be uh, this, this data had to be encrypted with specific ukraine algorithms and we had to fit this into the existing uh, framework and, and not just uh, the algorithm but also the implementation was standardized and we had to use a specific implementations from Ukrainian institutions who developed them. And of course, like Ukraine is, is such a big uh, country and um, they had their own, let's say, view or vision how they want to build uh, e-government and, and, and they are really being like very, very active. And mm-hmm. right now they are in the, let's say, in the new circle. They are preparing for Trembita 2.0. That is like Jesus, a, time flies. That's yeah, it's, it, it will be even better and, and, uh, and so on. Yeah. And then, of course, we have other, other projects as well. Uh, and probably uh, something that is really, really different uh, is Japan. Because everywhere else we are dealing with e-government projects. But in Japan, it's a commercial, like we are working with Sumitomo Mitsui Trust Bank, and they have chosen our technology to build their data bank solutions. Mm-hmm. We are going through a series of proof of concepts projects, each one of, of them being bigger and, and more important and, and showing different aspects of this technology and building the business case. And it's been really, really interesting for, for us to kind of like uh, be part of this. Yeah, I think Arne can give a really uh, interesting point on the different uh, possible difficulties uh, that the nations might have for implementing an XROAD-based solution or something similar. Because, for example, the nations uh, that we've consulted with, that we've advised, that have shown interest in uh, adopting XROAD similar to XTE, then uh, there are definitely main points that uh, they uh, there could be a struggle with so one would be the existing infrastructure mm-hmm. that I said that uh, could be could have already existed for years and years. The other would be definitely the legal side uh, to bring that up to date with digital standards with the possibilities that the digital solutions can provide so this digital signature mm-hmm. as well and uh, the third would be data governance and uh, data standardization between mm-hmm. that uh, specific nations different uh, public organizations, their infor- information systems. Yeah. If, if you have uh, data for one citizen stored um, in multiple different places slightly differently, then this definitely creates a hurdle when you're trying to connect everything up because the data might not match what uh, is in uh, one place versus the other place. So these are definitely all aspects that uh, must be thought of, must be sold uh, to adopt such a solution. This issue of uh, yeah harmonization and then deciding who's the single source of truth uh, after all. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, in, in my line of work as a digital transformation advisor, um, one of the biggest questions that I get from uh, from the delegations here at the briefing center is uh, X-Road sounds amazing, x sounds amazing, um, but doesn't it only work in small countries? Um, <laughs> Now, um, I see some raised eyebrows uh, around and behind the microphones. Um, What are your thoughts on this? Uh, Would it perhaps even work better in bigger countries? What do we think? Like technically? Um, Yes. Um, Would it make a difference at all? And if so, would it be easier? It has been designed to scale the world level. So (laughs) I, I cannot see any obstacle why we couldn't have a security server in every organization in the world and all connected and all communicating with each other. Everybody at home, please write that down. Thank you. And another aspect, if we're talking about uh, sizes of different countries, are the country-specific parameters. Uh, the, As I said, the what infrastructure is there already? All these questions, all these uh, points uh, that might need to be solved. But mm-hmm. additionally, uh, you know, the... Uh, uh, the different resources of the countries and so uh, can they focus that, can they channel that into uh, 
improving their uh, realization to provide the best digital country that they can. Mm-hmm. This is definitely how much of a priority is it internally in this country to make this go. Yeah. So this is also a key aspect. Absolutely. Um, I've got two final questions for us to very slowly wrap up. Um, the first one um, concerns uh, a protagonist uh, in this story of digital societies that also has an X in the name. It's Gaia X. Um, how do we feel about um, the design that is currently being pushed across the European Union? Can it... Uh, can it uh, coexist with with the X road and or the different iterations of the X road, whether it's in uh, in Estonia uh, or or Iceland or Finland? Um, do we do we think that uh, there there is a potential challenge uh, that exists? What do we what do we think? Uh, for me, I think those two things are at different levels, so I don't see any incompatibilities. Like Kaya X is a system that would uh, provide a cloud infrastructure mm-hmm. for Europe with uh, capability to kind of like um, instantiate different applications on, on different kind of like a geographical locations, but still uh, under the common kind of like a management and guidance. And uh, X Road is a data exchange uh, platform. Mm-hmm. And I mean, like, uh, it can be application. Mm-hmm. that is running on top of Kaya X. You can instantiate X Road security servers in Kaya X infrastructure yeah. and, and provide kind of like organization level connectivity. Mm-hmm. Like it, it's, it's really important that, that really X Road is a tool for connecting organizations and not systems. Yeah. Kaya is a, is a tool for, for running systems. Mm-hmm. And now so X Road is kind of like a one at least one level above yeah. this Gaia X level. So I don't see any incompatibility. So, and when Gaia X uh, eventually materializes, I think that uh, X Road would be a very good application that one would like to run on top of Gaia X. Peaceful coexistence. Yeah, yeah. Looks like it. Sounds good. Then uh, on to the very last question. Um, so we've had 20 years of the X Road now. What do we wish the X Road for the next 20 years? If you were uh, the people um, that could single handedly decide where the X Road goes next, what should it do? What should be different? Or, or have we reached a, a level where everything is hunky dory and uh, all work is done? You know, I think that. Uh, the role of uh, X-Road as a technical solution is to be this uh, hidden, almost invisible technical foundation Mm. for the uh, country that has implemented it. It's E-Nation to provide uh, services to its citizens. So if we're talking about uh, what amazing features or what... um, uh, what the uh, fantastic future of uh, X-Road would be, then I sincerely hope it continues being the solid foundation that uh, the E-Nation can build itself on and uh, perhaps just uh, keeping up to date with uh, the latest technologies to uh, be able to support as we are supporting the uh, different uh, e-nation solutions to mm-hmm. citizens to just yeah provide a solid good foundation trusted foundation and i don't think it needs to do much more than that all right that's a good statement arna your thoughts mm-hmm. i think that's a need for this service like connecting organizations it's kind of like a, to provide a building block mm-hmm. very very basic service just a synchronous call from one organization to, to another it will stay forever whatever new approaches or communication patterns we devise like this is a foundation that everything else can be built on top of but uh, i think that uh, we need to change the implementation soon uh, we might uh, i think the concept itself is is still valid and i, I cannot see anything at the moment that might change that but the implementation it definitely must change and we uh, exactly uh, uh, like we had 10 years ago we situation was different i mean mm-hmm. like we had so many new requirements and and so, let's say the landscape has was changed and, and it's changing now as well both legal technical etc so probably in one two three years we need to start 
to rewriting it from scratch, <laughs> perhaps <laughs> keeping something, uh, but uh, yeah. I mean, I agree that we definitely can't, you know, uh, put our legs up on the couch, say, uh, okay, we have it good, let's, uh, you know, rest, uh, let's take a break. Yeah. Uh, we definitely need to keep moving forwards, we need to keep looking forwards, and I think just uh, in the last year, or a bit over a year, one of the uh, improvements that uh, we in Estonia have implemented is the Ixta self-service environment, which uh, has definitely uh, improved, in my opinion, the uh, process to joining Ixta has mm -hmm. lowered the barrier to entry for organizations. So the process isn't as complex. It's more autonomous, more uh, automatic, more streamlined. Um, Can you describe how, how long it used to take or how difficult it used to be and, and how that is now? Yeah, absolutely. The, uh, uh, let's remember, the, it's been almost implemented for a year and slightly more. The uh, process before that was basically an organization was interested in joining Ixta. Uh, and uh, so they Googled, what is Ixta? How do I join? They found some documentation, some uh, uh, very big documentation uh, that covered, in truth, it covered all the steps required. In practice, it was a very long, heavy, and a uh, bit technical documentation that uh, led to many questions coming into the, uh, our help desk that uh, meant it was actually sometimes simpler to reply to keep in contact with the organization representative via a help desk ticket and, you know, pull them, board, pull them on board manually. Mm -hmm. But uh, with the Ixta self-service environment, we really wanted to change that. We had a goal of making the process, the joining process, take as few clicks as possible. No longer would they have to email help desk regarding a very complicated document or uh, asking for advice for the next steps. Instead, they can um, log into the self-service environment. They can, uh, because it is connected to the Estonian business registry, they, uh, some of their uh, data, whether they represent any organizations, uh, is uh, pulled from the business registry. They can, so we automatically because we have the data in, in our government, we have the data, uh, we can simplify the process so that when they log in, they can see if uh, they have the right to represent an organization, they click their organization that they are representing and they digitally sign in the uh, web page, they digitally sign the Ixta terms and services contract mm -hmm. and that's it, that organization is uh, added uh, the, or automatically to Ixta, to all the environments that we have, development, testing, and production. And uh, we can say that that organization has joined Ixta. So no, no longer long, confusing documents, no longer waiting for help desk. Just we have the data, we ask the data, they have an organization, they join with the organization. Done. Absolutely. Sounds good. Well, uh, this only leaves me uh, with uh, one more thing to say. Thank you so much uh, to, to both of you uh, for giving uh, your, your insights to me and sharing them with the audience as well. Um, it it uh, leaves uh, for me to say um, happy birthday, uh, X-Road, and to many, many more successful years. Uh, thank you so much to both of you for being here, and thank you so much for listening to you guys at home. And we'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye. And that's the end of yet another thought-provoking conversation about the art of digitalization. In the meantime, make sure to stay connected with eEstonia on Facebook, Twitter and LinkedIn. You can also check out our website e-estonia.com to learn more about digitalization in this beautiful country and other upcoming events. For now, that is all from our side. Stay tuned for our next podcast episode and have a great day.